A hiker by the name of Roger Caldwell was terrified after a hiking trip in 2005 when he claims that these two beings were hunting him. But before we get into today's video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. Let's go. This story comes from us from a man named Roger Caldwell, who in 2005 spent a year hiking the Appalachian Trail. Mr. Caldwell considers himself an experienced outdoorsman who has never been afraid of anything in the woods before. But in 2005, he experienced something that had scared him so much, he did not go camping again for almost an entire year. His claim is that while hiking the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina, during the month of October, he was deep in the woods with no cell reception and a few miles from any campgrounds. He was camping solo and had set up his tent close to the trail by a small creek. After cooking himself dinner, he went walking along the trail to get familiar with his surroundings. He states that he must have walked for about an hour when he decided to return to camp because it was now beginning to get very dark. He began to notice that it was getting darker than usual. While heading back to camp, the woods also became so dark that he immediately needed a flashlight to see where the trail was. He thought this was strange because it usually doesn't get dark this quick. Well, after walking for about 45 minutes, he figured he was about 10 or so minutes away from his campsite when he saw what looked like a large dog sitting just off the trail to his right. It was huge with large pointed ears and what he described were horns. It had its head down as if listening. As he got within 10 feet of it out of curiosity, it stood up and he could tell this creature was at least eight feet tall. Immediately, overcome with primal fear, he began to run to his campsite. And when he got within about 50 feet, he could hear this creature pursuing him, breaking branches, everything crackling behind him, and the sound of thudded footstep. Bo, 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 bo. This thing was following him. He turned and saw this animal actually physically walking on two legs heading right towards him. Now, upon reaching his campsite, he immediately starts a fire to get the camp blazing for light, unzips the tent door, grabs his handgun, even though he realized it probably wasn't going to do much against whatever this was. He could see this thing now walking along the edge of the camp, just staying out of the light of the fire. He could see its profile every now and again as it kept circling, waiting for a weak spot. And he stayed inside the tent because he thought this thing would just rip through the tent fabric and grab hold of him. So he gets back out of the tent and now decides to sit as close to the fire as possible. This thing continued to occasionally pass so dangerously close to the fire, he began to worry that it might try to seize him. Being so close, he was able to get a pretty good look at it. He described how the front of its body was covered in fur and disgusting mangy flesh, but also appeared goat-like with horns on its head. He described its face almost human-esque, but its eyes were terrifying, like a glowing fiery red. It kept moving and pacing around the campsite continuously over and over again. And so he'd have to keep positioning himself around the back of the fire to keep his view of this thing without scorching his back. And he could hear branches breaking and twigs snapping and just the general sound of this thing stalking him. They kept trying to approach the camp, but fire had prevented it from coming any closer as if the light or the heat had somehow hurt it. He would hear it scream once when it got too close to the fire. And Roger said the scream reminded him more of a cross between a wolf and a human, and to describe it as purely terrifying. Now, right after it screamed, he remembers hearing a snapping sound and seeing the entire tent shake. And he heard what sounded like rocks being chucked at his tent, and then in his direction in front of the fire. He began to feel even more terrified as if this was even possible at this point, like something was going to strike him at any given moment. He held his gun so tightly in his hand that I'm sure his fingers were hurting. Then he goes on to say that that's when he heard what sounded like another creature close to him just off the trail. It too was walking and snapping the foliage and making tons of noise as it approached from the other side. What he initially thought was someone coming to rescue him, he could hear heavy, heavy steps, 
One set was very heavy and the other was quicker and lighter. He noticed that one set was heavy and slow and the other lighter and quicker. The heavier one was coming from the left where he had seen the previous creature and what sounded like a smaller animal was now coming from the right. At one time, they both came into view as they passed close to the fire. He could see that the second creature was now very tall, human-like, but with reddish skin, large eyes, and also horns protruding from its head. It wore no clothing and had a very muscular, almost gorilla-like body. The first creature was more canine goat-like, but this one moved on all fours now. They came in and out of view for only a few seconds and were actually walking together. The human-like one, now done on all fours, while leading the other one away. They went out of sight, and as they did, passed behind and left him alone. He remembered hearing them walk along the trail and then hearing everything breaking and snapping as they moved off in the distance deep into the woods. It then became deathly quiet, and he now noticed he could see the stars for the first time as if it had somehow became lighter. It was then that he realized how dark it had become earlier, as if enveloped by some sort of black mist. There were also now the distinct sounds of insects and night ambiance around him. He didn't move from that spot though in front of the fire the entire night. He did not get any rest, and as soon as the sun came up early the following morning, he quickly packed his belongings and left. He said he didn't believe these creatures were after him. He thinks they hunted as a pack and were passing through the area when they came across his tent. The goat-like canine creature may have smelt his food or the fire and the human-like one must have followed it. They may have been curious about him in his tent, but they were more aggressive than he expected. He believed they were protecting their territory and he just happened to be in it. He thinks that what he saw could have been what is called the Cedardale monster. He has seen pictures of the Cedardale monster that had been spotted in North Carolina in the 1970s, which looked very similar to what he saw. It had a horn-like protrusion on its head that could have been its ears, possibly. The eyes, though, as he recalls, were the scariest part. They looked like a fiery, bright red, and he was terrified because they seemed so human-like. One second, and then very animal-like the next. Since that incident, he has decided not to return to the area. Bethany's encounter is a strange one. Bethany lives in Western North Carolina and enjoys hiking in the woods or walking around with her dog, Bella. She says she has always felt at one with nature and loved animals, so she was surprised at what had happened to her. Bethany was walking Bella at a local park early in the morning, around 7.30, and they were on the trail that runs along the river. All of a sudden, Bethany felt like something was watching her. She turned and looked straight up into the trees and saw a man, or what she thought was a man, sitting high up perched on a branch. She thought he must have been a park employee watching out for people and animals using the trail. She thought he was about 15 or so feet up in the tree and must have climbed up there to watch over the trail. Don't get me wrong, she thought this was very bizarre, and so she started to walk toward him to get a better look because of how strange this all is, and as she gets closer, she realized that he wasn't wearing a uniform, but in fact was naked. Bethany says she was about 10 feet away from the tree when she noticed he had no clothes and that it was strange that he would climb up a tree without anything on. From that distance though, and then as she closed it in, she could see that his body was actually covered in thick hair. His face was now vaguely human, but she could make out he had a snout, and his eyes were very large and were almost yellowish, and he was kind of leaning forward looking at her. She was now frozen in place, couldn't even let go of Bella's leash to get her phone out to take a picture. She thought surely somebody else must be watching this because he was so exposed up in the tree, but nobody else was around. He, or it, leaned forward, dropped down from the tree, landing in front of her on all fours. She dropped Bella's leash, and Bella suddenly bolted off, ran across the field, and sat down somewhere else. Bethany said that she couldn't take her eyes off this thing. It looked at her for a moment, then leaned down, and strategically began sniffing around her. It then stood up and disappeared off right through the tree line. She just collapsed right there because she was so stunned, thinking, did that just happen? Did I just see that? 
and after a few moments, Bella came back over to her completely terrified. She had no choice but to go to her car where she sat there for a while because she was so shaken up. She then decided she wanted to go back to that location to see if she could find anything that might prove that that wasn't some hallucination. She explained that when she got back to the spot, looking up into the tree and looking around for any evidence, there was nothing. No torn off limbs, no tracks, or any other signs that somebody had even been there like what had just happened. But she did see some hair that looked strange. As she was kind of scanning, looking around and feeling for anything strange, she began to see this shape open up in the sky near her. And she described it being a portal where two entities came out. One of which she described looking like an older man in long white flowing robes that appeared translucent while another looked to be a similar version of the creature she had just seen jumping out of the tree and disappearing. She immediately thought, there's no way this is happening, I must be seeing things. The older looking being had a device in its hand that lit up as he began walking toward her. Now, not only is she seeing this, but she notices that this being also has six fingers, which is an interesting note. As he or it got closer to her, the device began changing in color, and she noticed that the animal creature, whatever you want to call it, would turn in the direction the man would point the device in. It was like it was enticed or watching a magic trick. It was amazing and frightening at the same time, she describes. The man pointed the device in her direction and began to speak to her telepathically. She could not understand the words he was saying aloud, and then the device began to hum at a very low frequency and she felt paralyzed. She watched as this levitating old man being moved around her while pointing this device in multiple directions, going on and talking to her in a language telepathically she could not understand, until at one point it began to speak English and said, do not be afraid of us, we mean you no harm. The being and creature then began to move and levitate back towards the portal where it closed up. The man and the being, by some unseen force, were now being pulled back towards the portal about six feet off the ground. And that's when she realized, too, that she had now been lifted off the ground, probably by that device this being had, and was now slowly being pulled towards this portal opening with them. She found herself completely unable to move her arms or legs. She tried to scream, but her mouth would not work. She was just floating there, limp in the air, moving ever so slowly getting closer and closer to this ripple in the air. It almost seemed to glimmer and give off a silvery glow alongside the outer edges as the closer she got. And as she was about to enter this portal, she said that from inside she could see a dark cavernous hallway with other disgusting grotesque beings. Upon entering, it would seem like she could see far away and there were many other beings in the distance and she could see the area they were walking through and it was worse than what she thought. The man or being, whatever he was, was beckoning her to follow him inside this portal of some kind. She then heard Bella barking aggressively and freaking out, which she was then dropped back to the ground and the portal instantaneously closed. She said she could hear Bella cowering and scared out of her mind. And by the time she had dropped to the ground, she ran back to her car without a second thought. When she got back there, she realized that her clock read 4.30. Somehow, she had been at the park for over eight hours. She swears she had thought they had been there for only about an hour when this event happened, so where did all the time go? And before she knew it, she realized Bella was not with her. She could not leave without her. So she gets out of the car again and begins to frantically call for Bella. In the height of the entire situation, she must have not realized that Bella either ran off or worse. She says that she did not come back or want to go back to the area where this portal opened up, whatever you want to call it, but she remembered that the last place she saw Bella was right then and there. So Bethany goes on to say that Bella is the love of her life and could not just leave her there. So Bethany began to go back to where this all happened, where she had saw this being in the portal, and she had said that as she made it back to this spot, she began having these vivid hallucinations, like real-life dreams of this same old man being pointing his finger at her with a device in his hand, causing her to weaken, 
like the life force was being drained out of her body, telling her telepathically, go now, do not come back, Bella is with us. The next thing she remembers is sitting in her car in the driveway of her home. She does not remember driving home, and her lovely Bella is now not with her. She kept thinking, how did I get home? How did I get home so fast? Why don't I have Bella? At this point in her story, Bethany swears she was too terrified to go back to that park to look for Bella, which by the way, she never mentioned the exact national park that this happened. She could not go back to the park after what had just occurred. And since that day, Bethany and her husband have looked for Bella everywhere, but she is gone. Bethany says of Bella, she was my angel, my best friend. I don't know what happened to her, but I'm convinced those beings took her. She goes on to say that my husband thinks I'm crazy and that there's no way that some other beings could take a dog. I think it was supernatural, but he's not convinced of my story. Bella also had a collar and a tag with the name and number, so if anybody happens to find her, they would know how to contact me. I have looked all over the neighborhood for her and asked everyone I saw, but no one has seen her. She is a lab husky mix, so she would be hard to miss. Bella was loved by everybody who met her, and she can't believe that she is gone. Bethany still looks for her everywhere she goes and keeps hoping she'll one day show up. And she asks, what happened? What was the other being? Why did she go missing for eight hours and how did she get back home? She has no explanation for any of this, and the only thing that even makes remote sense is that it had to have been supernatural. Bethany fears that whatever this was will come back for her next because she believes that she witnessed a portal opening. She understands that she knows this story is completely crazy and wouldn't be shocked if she wasn't taken seriously just due to the nature of it, but she thinks that there might be some connections between what happened and alien abductions or if there is any connection. Either way, she's gonna pursue this and try to find answers. She also stated that she once read a book that told of a portal opening by someone playing a specific sequence of notes on the flute in the woods. She is also wondering about the older looking man and what device he was using. She wonders if the man was using that device to control her or if he took Bella. She was thinking about that device after the incident occurred because she would have this horrific pain all throughout her body. Supposedly, the area where Bethany encountered this being coming through a portal was investigated by a group called Expanded Consciousness and Paranormal Research, also known as ECPAR. They had apparently used a canine and thermal imaging during their investigation. The team also made inquiries to the local authorities and checked surveillance tapes from nearby businesses. No other people were seen in the area at the time of this incident. Bella was not seen on any of the surveillance tapes either. When checking the area for torn up trees or branches, none were found. The investigators still felt that Bethany's account was highly credible. There were no unusual electromagnetic fields found in the park during the investigation either. While the investigators were in the area, Bethany was contacted and asked about any other paranormal experiences. She responded by telling them about an incident that had happened the night prior. She dreamed of being in a room with a large being and three smaller ones. The smaller ones were trying to get her attention, but she was so focused on this large one. She felt that she was in some sort of meeting. The large being turned to look at the little ones and then turned back to look at her. The being leaned in as if to tell her something, and then she felt immediate fear. This being grimaced at her and she felt a shock throughout her body and woke up. When going over Bethany's encounter and the paranormal dream she experienced, Ekpar suggested that a supernatural portal might exist. There's no way to know if the being seen by Bethany in her dream was the same one that she experienced. The area is near a river and surrounded by heavily wooded areas. Portals or vortexes can be found in many regions all throughout the world. The being that came through the portal might have actually been an interdimensional traveler. According to Native American Indian folklore, many animals in the world apparently have the ability to shapeshift, or so it is believed. It is possible that the beings seen by Bethany also possess the ability to shapeshift. The area has had reports of other sightings as well, and there is a being that has been reported in the area for years, and not just Bigfoot. People have seen beings coming and going for years. The area is also known for paranormal activities. There have been reports of orbs and other unexplained phenomena. 
It is also an area where many people claim to have seen UFO encounters and other strange anomalies. For these reasons, and Bethany's credibility, Ekpar concluded that the area might be a supernatural hotspot. Hello, What Lurks Beneath. My name is John Templeton. I have been retired from the Park Service for six years now and feel that it is my time I share my story of events that occurred while I was working in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. John begins his story by explaining to us about the location he was in while on his patrol. An interesting note to this story is the number of UFO sightings that have occurred in the Great Smoky Mountain Park over the years. Let's let John tell his story. John states he was on a patrol on an ATV in the backcountry, not far from Spence Field. Spence Field sits right on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. John says it was just before dusk and he was on a small dirt service road. He was coming down a hill and had just turned a bend in the road when something caught his attention. On the other side of the road, about 100 yards away, was an unidentified flying object that was hovering about 50 feet in the air. He stops, stared, wondering if what he was seeing was true. He described it as a circular craft about 30 to 50 feet in diameter. It was metallic silver, no markings of any kind. It appeared to be bottom heavy and was rocking back and forth violently. He stated he had clear line of sight as he watched the unidentified object land on a patch of flat ground. Then, from the front of the craft, a door opened and a being stepped out. As it stood there, it seemed to look around. Now, according to John, it appeared to be humanoid in shape but very tall. From a distance, he could not tell if he was wearing a spacesuit or had an oddly shaped body or what, but it seemed to be glancing this way and that. And John said that it seemed to look right at him and he thought he would pass out from fear that had engulfed him. He didn't know why he was afraid because he did not feel in danger, but it was just an overwhelming sense of dread. Then the being turned around and went back inside the UFO. The craft's door then closed and he heard a slight humming sound. Then the craft began to move horizontally across the road. It passed behind a clump of trees and he thought that was it, but then it came back from behind and continued moving over the road. It went over a ridge and out of sight, and he sat there on the ATV for a few minutes waiting to see if it would return before heading back to the station. When he returned, he said he wasn't sure if he wanted to report it as an incident, so he decided not to. He told a few other rangers the following day about it, and no one seemed to take him seriously. His routine morning consisted of nothing more than the usual paperwork and the inspection of campsites. In the afternoon, he was on patrol in the same location where he had seen a UFO the previous day. And that's right when he had saw another one. He claims that it had landed near where he had seen the first one. Again, there was a creature standing at the door of the UFO and it sort of floated down to the ground and began to look around. Two more of these beings seemed to materialize and they just seemed to sort of levitate off the ground. And he saw three of them moving together towards the ridge. They seemed to be searching for something. John watched in amazement, and he had got a call right there from the ranger station that was claiming that there are two hikers who had just seen this thing. They said it landed, and he was asked to check it out. The coordinates were the exact same area that he was in, and he too had reported that he had a visual on something resembling exactly what they claimed. John says, just then, another thing came into view, another larger UFO but it was circular and larger than the first. He watched as it hovered about 10 feet off the ground, landed, and yet these golden angelic beings had emerged from it and approached the other craft. One of them was carrying this strange golden object in its hand that looked somewhat like a large golden box. The four then vanished into thin air as if they were vapor right near the entryway of the larger ship or at least where he saw one of these beings come out of. It then rose into the air and passed over the ridge. Now, John was thinking, I've got to go check this area out. And he says as he walked towards one of the initial areas and approached it very cautiously, he felt a strange sensation, electrical, and began to hear a slight humming sound, which was very faint. Because of this, he did not get any closer and felt as if he was in grave danger. This is when he debated on whether or not he should leave the area. 
so he got a call from his radio instructing him to immediately report back to the station. Relieved, he got out of there. Now when John returned to the station, the two hikers who had called previously were still there and told him what they had seen. They too had seen the same craft and these strange beings come out of the ship. Of course, with John trying to remain professional, he tried to play it off as though they were joking and told him yes, he would put it in his report that there was a UFO in the area. They looked at him strangely and said that they had seen the same thing multiple days in a row. John stated that then his supervisor said he was to take him to the site where he had seen this because he wanted to verify the report. John's supervisor did not say a word to him on the way to the area, but just as though they crossed over this ridge, they saw this craft yet again. And they both sat there in amazement, jaws dropped, looking at this thing. The supervisor desperately wanted to get out of there, with John yelling, look! The other craft they had seen earlier came back over the ridge, hovering over the craft now on the ground that John suspects was previously cloaked. He told his supervisor that that was the other ship. They watched as this craft that had been on the ground began to levitate into the air and began to head in the direction of the other craft. The larger craft above it seemed to open a door from underneath, where the smaller craft seemed to be sucked into it. After that, the second ship, the larger one, took off over the ridge and disappeared completely out of sight. They both sat stunned by what they had just seen, and the supervisor said, now I know why you didn't report anything. And he strongly suggested him and John not say a word about any of this, and they agreed. Later that same day, another group of campers called the station to report what they were witnessing was a UFO landing not far from them but their location was on the other side of the ridge where they had seen the craft land. Now John's supervisor calls him on the radio and says, you're not gonna believe this, but we just got a report of another sighting. I think you should go and investigate, but keep it confidential. And if you say anything, call me directly. Don't say anything to anybody else. So he drove over to that campsite area. John mentions that the campers were two men and two women and they had told them exactly what they had seen, which was the larger craft. John decided to tell them that he believed what they had seen was something he'd like to investigate. After investigating the area where they claimed they had seen it, John could see indentations in the ground where the ship had supposedly landed, or at least burn marks in the grass. They also claimed to have seen two beings come out of the craft and disappear into the woods, and that they all felt these strange electrical sensations. How did the beings you saw appear to you? Were they walking around, looking at things, or just standing there? Did they materialize? Did they vanish? He wanted to know every detail about the encounter. He told them he would have to get their names and contact information to get back to them if they had any more questions. As he was writing the report, one of the campers shouted, there it is, as he pointed toward the other side of the ridge where they had first seen the UFO, and John looks back along with them to see a large UFO heading in their direction. They all watched as the ship crossed the ridge, then instantly shot straight up into the clouds and disappeared. John says he told them to just sit tight and would be back in a little while. He went over to his truck and called the supervisor on the radio, telling him the situation, and the supervisor told him to return to the station ASAP. John told the campers that he would have to file a report and that they can go ahead and stay. But they said they didn't feel safe and would have to leave the park. I mean, John cannot blame them. The supervisor at the station had asked that they keep everything quiet from now on about this, that the park administration cannot know anything about what's truly going on and to not report any further sightings. The park superintendent then issued a gag order on all of them. John claimed that he never followed up with those campers, but he had found out there had been other sightings in the area that he was unaware of. So he knows that these beings were on there on different occasions and wonders if they are still out there. And if you're wondering, by the way, this supposedly all took place between the years of 1971 and 1972. Is it true that Roger Caldwell in the first story saw beings beyond his wildest nightmares? Did Bethany truly come into contact with interdimensional beings from another plane of existence? And did John and his supervisor truly see a craft and beings that would defy any rational explanation? I'll let you decide. But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Be sure to let me know in the comments down below. Are these stories full of crap or are these genuine? 
I'd love to hear from all of you. And also, if you're a fan of storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button and hit that subscribe for more content just like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next video.